our study. Last week, we jumped back into it. And again, if you need an outline, give Brother Carter's attention. We jump back in. Verses 30 and 31. Heavily connected, very much tied to the same story and things. And so eh, we learned the first of two truths that are found within these verses. And that was simply this. Faith in God is the downfall of every stronghold. Okay? And as we considered Jericho and the walls that came tumbling down, we reminded ourselves that from a human perspective, the city seemed insurmountable, impregnable. It was unconquerable. And, and certainly that would have been the view um, uh, culturally across the board that uh, no one was going to defeat uh, Jericho. And so we, we commented, it was no doubt that Satan used it as one of his devices to discourage them, to stop the Israelites from making progress following God's commands, as he would do for each of us. And we reminded ourselves that is exactly what the devil's doing today, right? And uh, no doubt in your life today, in your life this week, the devil used his devices to try to slow you down, to tr try to trip you up spiritually, to cause you to, to do something, say something, think something that you ought not to, and, and really get you discouraged or whatever the case may be. He's, he's going to use his devices. We know what the Bible says, right? It, he wants to get advantage of us. He wants to gain an advantage. He wants to thwart any growth on your part and my part into the likeness of Jesus Christ. He wants you and I to give up on the struggle in, uh, described in Romans that brings maturity, that brings us into the likeness of Jesus Christ. And he wants us to give into the flesh and, and kind of ignore the spirit. That's his desire, to gain an advantage. Remember, Paul wrote of it in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. He, he wrote, let Satan should gain an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So don't be ignorant of that, of his devices. And no doubt, Satan wanted to use this great stronghold to stop the Israelites before they even got started in, in accessing and taking the promised land that God had promised. And so we said there's some truths born out. The first truth, too, born out or secondary truth would be this. The natural man arrives at the conclusions and decisions in life through that which seems rational from a human perspective, based mainly upon sight, what he sees. And so, as you can imagine, I like the story where kind of Joshua goes off and uh, likely a theophany, the captain of the Lord's army, met him there. And he's outside Jericho and he's looking at the walls. And no doubt, from a human perspective, Joshua was tempted to be discouraged, right? You're looking at these massive walls and you're looking at this city and like, how in the world? We, we don't have any siege uh, catapults and everything else, siege uh, machines and things. We, we don't have anything to attack this. And you can imagine from a human perspective, even for him that was discouraging and what happens in our flesh we often will um, apart from God we we subscribe to man's wisdom which God said is foolishness in vain we looked at verses and we surmise that the prevailing attitude in Jericho would have been though they feared and had terror because of the Lord in fact we'll see tonight that the statement is made they did not have courage Though that was certainly true, they would have still likely thought that within our city, within these walls, we're safe. The Jericonians, as I like to call them. They would, have, they would have thought, hey, as long as we stay in here, we'll be protected and so forth. In other words, human rationale and reasoning pointed to Jericho being a stronghold that Israel could never conquer. It would never fall, especially to such a, a force as this nation of Israel coming out of Egypt and novice soldiers and such. But we reminded ourselves of that most important fact that they left out, and that's of the story, and that's this. God is writing this story. And we know that what seems impossible to man is possible with God. And we reminded ourselves last week that the good news is, my friend, no matter what you face this week, God is writing your story. And what seems impossible to you and I, boy, is still and always possible with God. Israel then, as they had faith in God, became a great example for us. They weren't like the natural man. They were more like a believer, a believer of faith, the spiritual believer who arrives at convictions and decisions through what has been revealed, not rationale per se, though it is often rational, what God says and so forth. It's very logical, as we see in the Scriptures. But that is not the basis for their decisions and such. Their decisions and the choices in life is based upon what has been revealed by God himself to us. And we talk about those words or the response of faith, what should I do as Paul illustrated and so forth. But the believer, as Israel did, accepts it as fact and truth by faith. We'll see that even tonight. And 
when what he sees would lead one to arrive at a different conclusion, he operates by faith. And that faith led to the destruction of the walls of Jericho, didn't it? We said last time, and I love the statement, as if God reached down, he pulled down the walls or swatted them down from heaven and used the very substance of that wall to make an entrance for Israel to conquer that great stronghold, to go up and conquer and take the city. And it's truly what faith does, isn't it? We said this, faith in God turns your obstacles into stepping stones, as it did for Israel there at Jericho and to take you and I further and move us along uh, in progress according to the story that he has written. And then we ended with three things that we reminded ourselves of uh, for us to do. Be honest about the strongholds in our life. Identify your Jericho. What is it? What, what's the device the devil is even using this week to discourage you, to, to, to challenge you, to, to, to get you to quit and follow the Lord or doing right in a certain area? To be faithful. What, what's your Jericho? Then number two, we said, stop thinking, I can't gain the victory. What will I ever do? Start thinking that, God, you can give me the victory. What would you have me to do? So get your thinking right. And uh, stop having a defeatist attitude and start having a victorious attitude. Based upon God is on your side. And he can do the impossible. Then number three, we simply said this, march onward in this life in faith. Just be obedient. Uh, anticipate that God's going to make a way. And I, I, one of the things I love about this story is as they marched around, God had said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deliver this city, right? I, he promised them. He, they didn't know how. They didn't know if a whole uh, a horde of angels would come down and knock down the city. They, they had no idea, really, that the walls would fall down. They'd be able to go over those walls, right? And they did not have a, a large idea or a great idea of how God was going to do it. They just went forward in faith. They marched, right? They marched around the city. And so sometimes in this Christian life, can I just tell you, in some ways we've read the last chapter. We know how the big picture ends. Sometimes in our lives, though, we don't know what comes next. We don't know how this situation is going to end, this circumstance is going to play out, but your responsibility, my responsibility is to keep marching forward in faith. Keep trusting him. Just be obedient to what we know that he has commanded us to do. Tonight now we look at verse 31. Would you look there with me as we move on from verse 30? Verse 31 says this, by faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. Now, I find it rather poignant that the last personalized entry, so if you were to, 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 to gaze down, you'll see that um, this is really the last entirety of a verse that is dedicated to one personal entry of a person uh, commended for their faith, an individual person. And I find it rather poignant that this last such entry in the great hall of faith is of an individual's faith that led to their deliverance and salvation. Now, what I find also interesting, I don't believe it's an accident, that the verbiage here in this verse somewhat uh, mirrors the, the verbiage that we read in John chapter 3 and verse 16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Look at the verse, and notice what it says. She did not perish, right? Rahab perished not with them that what? Believe not. See, it, it, it is honestly a great gospel little picture here in this verse of the reality of Rahab. Boy, by faith, she trusted in God, and it mirrors well. She didn't perish with those that believe not. John 3 goes on, right? To him that believeth, not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, right? So very much similar to what we read here in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31. It's a powerful point. So what's the truth we see presented? I, I just sim in its nature it's simply this faith in God is the means of salvation for every great sinner faith in God is the means of salvation how it's available to us the means that we accept it right we accept salvation and it's for every great sinner what do we think about the verse well you read it and you find something you find that reality is front and center in the verse the facts are just presented as they are. Here's what happened. Here's what they are. They're, uh, and very much, it's, it's just simply given. There's no sugarcoating here, right? There's no avoidance of the uncomfortable. Because who, reading their Bible, wants to see a harlot or a prostitute highlighted? I mean, who wants to come across the verse and we see this kind of sinner, as we said in the title, the great sinner? How, how do we, most of us would not want that highlighted. This is the presentation of reality. And here's what I would call it, the reality of Rahab, the reality of Rahab. 
You say, what is that reality? Several things, and we'll be done with our study tonight in verse 31. Now, letter A is this, the first one. The reality of Rahab, she was a sinner of ill repute. Okay? I love that old description. The sinner of ill repute. Paul just kind of throws it out here under the, the leadership of the Holy Spirit, right? I mean, he, he calls Rahab what she is. She's a harlot. She's a prostitute, a woman of the night. She's a sinner of the ill repute. There's a great stain upon her life, her reputation. This is not a commendable person. This is not someone who immediately says, oh, she's a great person. That, not at all. Her immorality was deep. It was far spread. Interestingly, upon our first introduction to Rahab in Joshua chapter 2 and verse 1, that is exactly how she has identified first in the Bible. In fact, we read in Joshua 2.1, speaking of the spies, they came into a harlot's house named Rahab. Not very flattering, is it? There's no avoidance. There's no hiding of the reality. There's no minimizing. There's no condoning of it either. It's just the acknowledgement of the reality of where Rahab is. She is a sinner in need of saving. She is a sinner in need of saving. And my friend, that's where faith always starts, isn't it? Where does faith start? Well, faith starts, you see it on your outline. Faith always must start with an honest realization and acknowledgement of just what one is in what one needs. Rahab does it. She's a great illustration. She realizes what she is. There's no pretense with her. She doesn't think, well, you know what? I'm still a pretty good person. I, I deserve it. You never hear that from Rahab. It's not in the passage at all that she says, man, I deserve it. I'm a pretty good person. You know, people we talk with today who, though they will admit they're sinners, still think they're good enough to get into heaven. That's not Rahab. You don't pick that up anywhere in the scriptures that Rahab had this mentality. No, there is an honest acknowledgement on her behalf. I need saving. I, I, can't, I can't escape Jericho. I can't escape the, the condemnation, the devastation, the destruction that's going to come upon uh, Jericho by myself. I need saving. She understood what she needed, and there's an honest realization and acknowledgement of what she was. We think of Rahab, no doubt there's many who would love to ask God today, well, why Rahab? You know, in this city, and we don't know the population. I've heard all kinds of estimates from as low as 3,000 to 50,000 in the city of Jericho. We really have, uh, even from archaeological digs, we really have no good guesstimation of that. But let's just say it's 10, 15,000 people. Why Rahab? Couldn't you have found a good merchant, a pretty good person, who, a pretty good righteous person who, who tried to do their best in life? Couldn't we have found someone else? And certainly that has been the question down through the ages. Why Rahab? And why is she mentioned in this? Why did God take her from a house of shame to the hall of fame? Why? Why Rahab? It's a good question. Here's the reality of Rahab. The reality of Rahab is this. She's an unlikely candidate for salvation. She is an unlikely candidate for salvation. She was a Gentile. She wasn't one of the Jews. She was likely an earthly outcast because of her sinful occupation, even there in Jericho. She was likely looked down upon an outcast in some way. She was a woman, certainly under condemnation, living in a city facing condemnation. I mean, think about it. Would you find a more unlikely person to put their faith and trust in the holy God of Israel. A holy God who demanded of his own people that they be pure and righteous and clean. I mean, we just you get done reading all the laws that God just gave Israel, and he is a pure and holy God. And she's a harlot. Could you find a more unlikely candidate? Could you imagine? What we have learned of the Jewish leaders since the days of Christ and even before. Could you imagine what the Jewish leaders and Pharisees and others were their response to reading the name Harlot? And the reading the name Rahab? As they got out the scriptures and they read the old stories and there in the temples and every Sabbath day. And you can imagine many of them did so with a grimace. They, they did so with much chagrin. They, they, they had a great dislike for even bringing up this Harlot, bringing up this lady named Rahab. I like what Sir Robert Anderson stated or wrote. He said this, those who seek for proofs of the divine authorship of the scripture may find one here. Was there ever an Israelite who would have thought of preferring that woman's name to the names of David and Samuel and the prophets? A reference to, listen, she's mentioned here. And David is not. Samuel is not. 
She's given her own verse. And these other great heroes of faith are not mentioned here. Preferring that woman's name to the names of David and Samuel the prophets. And coupling it with the name of the great apostle and prophet of the Jewish faith. Describe whom the Lord knew face to face. And to whom he spoke as a man speaketh unto his friend. That's a description from Exodus of Moses. That God said that that's his relationship with Moses. And here she is mentioned right with Moses in Hebrews chapter 11. And what Jew would have dared to give expression to such a thought? But God's thoughts are not our thought. And he who immortalized the devotion of the widow who threw her last two mites in the temple treasury has decreed the faith of Rahab who, like Moses, took sides with the people of God, shall never be forgotten. You see, my friend, she was the least likely and least wanted candidate for salvation from a human perspective. I find it amazing. Many so-called commentators, Bible commentators and theologians down through the ages, you know what they've done? They tried to rework the Hebrew words and they, they tried to change some things. Well, this word harlot, that doesn't really mean a prostitute. That, that means a, a, a hostess. Oh, no, that doesn't mean prostitute. That doesn't mean harlot. No, no, no. That means an owner of a tavern. Like that's any better. But anyway... They, they just, you know, it has a less uh, uh, re ill re reputation, a bad reputation. It has less thing to look down. So they tried to change it. Listen, you and I don't need to make anything in the Bible look better. It is what God says it is. And my friend, can I tell you, it certainly, though it may put man in a bad light, it always puts God in a good light. That's what happens here. This is a harlot. This is someone who is the least likely candidate. And here you, are, you and I are. 20 24. You and I are studying a book of the New Testament of God's Word and the name of a harlot that lives some 1,500 years before Christ. And she is mentioned here in the Hall of Faith as an example. Oh, she's a great sinner. There's no denying that. And there's no condoning of her lifestyle. There are certainly consequences that she would have faced and things that would have come from this sin. Be sure your sin will find you out. That is always true. It is not a minimizing of the sin of Rahab. But my friend, it is a, a maximizing, if I could put it that way, of God's love, of God's grace. That's what this story is about. And the simple reality of faith. You see... I like to think, and as I'm studying, I, I couldn't help but allow my mind to go to this simple truth. You couldn't ask for a greater example of God's proclamation of whosoever will. Whoever. It's open to everyone. But I'm the chief of sinners. Yes, Paul, we know, but salvation is open to you. Yeah, Rahab, we know your lifestyle there in Jericho. You lived in the world of the world. You were the world. You were everything. But God's invitation is open to you. Whosoever will. I don't know about you tonight, but I sure am thankful. You know what this story teaches us? It teaches us that faith is no respecter of persons. But rather, it is an equal opportunity employee. You know, we hear a lot today of equal opportunity employers. Though Everybody can come apply for a job and everything else, and there's no discrimination based upon all this long list of things, and it's only getting longer the more our culture changes it. Amen? So you can't, you can't discriminate. You have to be an equal opportunity employer. Can I tell you right now, listen to me, faith is an equal opportunity employee. What do you mean? It means it's ready to be employed by any and all. It's free for anybody to employ. You can have faith in God. The greatest of sinners, the, uh, the not so great sinners in your own mind, you can employ faith in God. And my friend, that is exactly what certainly the Israelites did in the taking of Jericho, but more specifically here, that includes you and me, and it includes a Gentile harlot in the city of Jericho in the days of Joshua. And that's what she did. Number three, or letter C, the reality of Rahab is this. She was an employer of simple faith. She was an employer of simple faith. Would you turn with me to Joshua chapter 2? Let's look at the story. Um, simply time will not allow us to read through the entirety of it. <coughs> but would you turn with me to Joshua chapter 2? We'll look in verse 8. And we're going to see this interaction between Rahab and the spies. And, and uh, it is very revealing. It is to me, it's amazing study and what she says. And so we're going to get into it tonight and kind of break it apart. 
do a quick analysis if we might. Joshua chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. Notice what it says. You remember the story, right? They came and the king sent after them trying to find them and so forth. And, and uh, she protected them. She took them up on the roof. She was going to lay them down on the roof. But notice what it says in verse, number, in verse number 8. And before they were laid down, she came up unto them upon the roof. And she said unto the men, and here's what she says. I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us. And that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And what ye did unto the <coughs> excuse me, two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord, or because of the Lord your God. He is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Now, therefore, I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, and that you also show kindness unto my father's house, and give me a true token, and that you will save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters and all that they have, and deliver out our lives from death. What a statement. You'll deliver our lives from death. Verse 14. And the men answered her, our life for yours. <laughs> our life for yours. Did someone give their life for you, friend? Hmm. It's an interesting statement, isn't it? They go on, our life for yours, if ye utter not this our business. And it shall be, and when the Lord hath given us the land, that we will deal kindly and truly with thee. Quick analysis, and what does Rahab say? And <laughs> what all does she communicate, acknowledge in this conversation, these few words with the spies of Israel? What does it reveal? Number one, see it in the outline, verse 10. You know what verse 10 says? She speaks of the facts that she has heard, and now she has believed it as true. That is completely clear. It's amazing, isn't it? How many of you are over 40 years old? Raise your hand. That's me too. How many of you remember things from 40 years ago? Everything. <laughs> Put your hand up. You remember everything? No. You might remember one or two things. You might remember some stuff. But do you realize what she says to them? She brings up things that happened over 40 years ago. 40 years ago. The crossing of the Red Sea. The, the exodus from Egypt. She brings it up. says, listen, we've heard of these things. We've heard of them. We, we, we got it down. Then she goes on some things that happened within the 40 years, right? The destruction of the kings there and so forth. She, she elaborates. Listen, we've heard these things. They've impacted me. In fact, I would put it this way. She rehearses some of the great works of Israel's God on their behalf to their spies. She's heard these things. Now listen, what can we derive from the fact that she brings it up 40 years later in one of the first conversations she has with these spies? Now listen, we, we know all about your God. Here's what your God has accomplished for you. Here's what your God has done for you. Now listen, it tells us several things. Number one, she's heard them. Number two, she's thought on these things. And number three, like Mary in Bethlehem, you know what she's done? She's hit them in her heart. She's taken note of them. She's filed them away because this is God is something different. These, this God of the Israelites, he's not like any God of Jericho. He's not like anybody else I've heard of in the things that he's accomplished for his people. And so she makes a special note about it. She has hid them in her heart after acknowledging them that this is reality. You know what some of us would have done? People of the world certainly would have. They would have, hey, hey, can I ask you a question? Did your God really split the Red Sea? She didn't do that. Did you catch it? It's interesting because we'll dwell on it here in a moment. She says what? I know. Hmm. What's the only way that she could know without having been there? She heard, she hid it in her heart, and she had faith. I know. I know because most of us are like, I, did that really happen? Are you sure that, that it, it, did, did you guys really defeat those kids? That's not what she says. She states it as fact. In fact, that's our next point. Would you notice it? Number two, here's what we see in verses 9 through 10. We see that what she has heard about the Lord, and I like that statement about Jehovah, the God, she says a couple different times, the Lord, produced faith in her heart. There was faith in her heart. 
She starts off her conversation with these spies. She tells them what? I know that the Lord hath given you the land. I like that. Hey, I know God's delivered in your hands. This is your land. She's already, she's already well established and, and accepted the fact that God has given them the promised land. And they're coming this way. She realized that both her and the inhabitants of the city were going to perish. How do we know that? She says, listen, would you save us from death? Can I tell you right now, you know what every person that needs to trust in Jesus Christ have to realize? For the wages of sin is death. John 3.16, you're going to perish. Unless you have everlasting life by putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Great little picture of the gospel. Great little reality of in her faith and understanding. She comes to the realization, we're going to perish apart from your God stepping in. God was going to deliver them in the hands of the Israelites. Then as she finishes this whole history recap in verses 9 and 10 with what she believes and knows to be reality. And I think this is just, man, you want a glimpse into Rahab's heart? Here it is. Here's what she says. For the Lord your God, he is, in, is God in heaven above and earth. Not he is one of many. Not, 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 hey, he might be. I don't know. He is. Jehovah, your God, the God of the Israelites, he is the God, the one and only, the sovereign God in heaven above and earth beneath. These are two resolute and, um, shall we say, very straightforward statements. Two statements of fact and reality. She boldly acknowledges and establishes that he the sovereign God of heaven and earth. Okay, now taking the next step, what else do we see from her? Okay, this is a great buildup. We see what's happening with her. Remember, three, in verses 12 through 13, that faith finds expression in a plea of salvation. Her faith is so real. It began with hearing the facts, and she accepted them as truth, as we must do in putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And then, as she did so, um, she it produced that faith in her heart, and that faith then comes out. It's expressed in a plea for salvation. Her faith is so real, it's of such depth that she begs for salvation. She gives a plea for salvation in her family, and I love the term, term, terminology. Did you hear what she said? Save a life. Save a life. Would you save a life? And I can't help but think that's. That's a pretty good way of saying what it means to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Amen? You've been saved, and you've been made alive in Jesus Christ. Save a life. I like that. She says, would you save a life? Me and my family and my, my dad's household and so forth. And I don't know about you, but this whole interaction makes me think of this verse. Romans chapter 10 and verse 10, we know it well. For with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Now listen to me. Would Rahab have asked them to save alive her family if she did not believe it could happen? Well, certainly not. She had faith that their God, that these spies could communicate enough and that their God would save her and her household, that he had the ability, the power to save. Already there was a faith in her heart that had begun and had, had sprouted and had begun to grow. And now the expression of that and her plea of salvation, that faith now finds a voice, finds the words to express itself in what we see here. Exactly what we find in her conversation with the spies that Joshua sent. And then fourthly, in both hiding the spies and assisting their escape and later the, the hanging of the uh, the, the linen out the window, the cord out the window, as the Bible describes it. Her faith produced faith confirming good works. Do you realize that as this, <coughs> as this lady Rahab come to put her faith and trust in Jesus Christ, it didn't take long for her faith to show itself in good works. That's exactly what our verse in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 31 describes. She had received the spies in peace. Maybe they were wondering for a place. Maybe she went out there and grabbed them and brought them in. And maybe the Holy Spirit uh, impressed upon her heart that who they were and so on. I, I don't know. We don't know the whole story. But I'll tell you right now, already in just the, the harboring of these spies and the protection of them, already her faith is producing good works and just hiding them. I like what James says in New Testament. 
the author, James, in James chapter 2, verse 25, speaking of, of Rahab, he says that her faith was humanly justified. In other words, it was on display. It was obvious to mankind and others that she had faith in God. How? Notice what he says. When she received the messengers and sent them out another way. You remember the story? People from Jericho went out to find them, and uh, they, they were searching this way, and so she led them out a different way of the city after they had already gone. And so they went up into the mountains. They waited there for a few days until the, <coughs> those that were seeking them got back to Jericho, and then they kept on their journey. And James says, listen, this is what she did. In the justification of her faith, in the sight of others, not in, in God's faith justifies in God's eyes. But a man's sight, they, she was justified by this fruit, these good works that she produced. Now, I'm going to throw at you a what if, a Pastor Henry what if, okay? So this isn't like the original language inspired and things like that, okay? I've often wondered if maybe, based upon what we read here of Rahab's and her conversation with the spies, do you think it's possible that she had already been praying to God for some time? A God that she did not know of but had heard of. The God of the Israelites. And maybe she had been asking him to reveal himself unto her. Maybe she had been asking him to, to save her. Maybe she had been asking and just seeking him to, uh, to show a sign, to send somebody. We know that God promises that those who seek him will find him. He's often sent someone into the way or along someone's path you just ask Saul and Ananias there in Damascus you 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 just ask Cornelius and Paul in Caesarea you, you ask the Ethiopian eunuch who God sent Philip to in the desert see God will always and send someone I find it most interesting that here in James and the Holy Spirit it led James to use that word you see it there messengers now it's interesting right because why do we find the term messengers is it a mess up of the translation certainly not is it is it something that was not correctly translated no i i think honestly i i think it was purposefully and rightfully correctly translated as messengers here in the king james bible what's interesting in that greek word you know what it's found over 150 other times in the scriptures and it's translated as either angel or angels hmm what do we know about angels? So don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying the spies were angels. Don't get that. Follow. Okay? They're not angels. But what are angels? Angels are always sent as the messengers of God. They are the ones who really, they do nothing else but the bidding of God. So I find it interesting that the, the terminology messengers is used here. Directly sent from God is what it means. Could it be? Could it just be? Here's the what if. Could it be? That it, just as Joshua sent these men out as spies to spy up the land, and specifically, I think it's Joshua chapter 2 tells us that um, uh, he sent them out to spy out Jericho too and the land. Could it be that as Joshua sent them out, God had a dual purpose for their trip? That at the same time, he was sending them out as his messengers to meet the woman who had been seeking him. And the only way that she knew how to do so. You see, it's interesting. You might say, well, Pastor Henry, maybe there's not a word for spies that could have been used. Well, we just read Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31, and guess what? It's a great word that's translated as spies. But James chose to use the word messenger. From a human perspective, it doesn't seem like there's any message given. Joshua didn't send them say, hey, well, go find this harlot that lives on such and such street and give her a message. We don't have any of that. They're there to spy out the land from Joshua's perspective. Could it be? Could it be that this is just another great example of our God always answering the seeking heart? I don't know, okay? So don't quote me. I'm not saying it is. But tell you what, first five minutes in heaven, you find me. I'll let you know if I was right, okay? Because heaven will only tell us, right? Okay? But I love the what ifs. What ifs based upon the rest of Scripture, right? And th these are what ifs. Could it, be, could it be that Rahab was praying and asking God to, uh, to show himself? Only heaven will reveal it for sure. But what we do know, faith, her faith produced good works in just a very short time. And the Bible says that to be so. That faith will always do something. Faith always produces fruit. It's a biblical principle. 
James hits on it greatly as we've studied. She heeded the words of those spies. I, I like it because after they left, she said, you do this. And, and uh, the instruction to put out the cord out of her window when the Israelites arrived. Now, here's what's interesting. We don't know how much time transpired between the time that the, the spies left and, and uh, their return with the whole nation of Israel. What's interesting, chronologically, according to Joshua, the spies were sent out well before they crossed the Jordan River. So it could have been a, quite a bit of time, certainly the seven days of marching. I, don't you wonder, I, <laughs> did, did Rahab's family gather in her house every day Israel marched? The cord out every day, oh, Israelites are marching, put out the cord, or it stayed out the whole time, and they all gathered together. Could you imagine that? Day one, Israelites march. They gather together. Nothing happened. We're going to do it tomorrow? Yeah, let's do it tomorrow. Day two. Nothing happened. Day three, nothing happened. Day four, nothing happened. You think they're losing faith? We know biblically they gathered together, the cord is out, and God rewarded her faith. God rewarded her faith. So the culmination of the story is letter D, isn't it? The reality of Rahab, that just like you and I, she's a saved sinner. You see, we know the rest of the story. We looked at it last week. God destroyed the walls of Jericho before, right before the people of Israel there at their feet, literally, delivered the city into their hands. In the midst of that, a great event. God and Joshua did not forget Rahab and her faith. Joshua chapter 6 and verse 22. But Joshua had said unto the two men that had spied out the country, go into the harlot's house, bring out hence the, thence the woman and all that she hath, as ye swear unto her. Here's a great picture of the reality that God keeps his word when it comes to deliverance, when it comes to salvation. The rout of Jericho has taken place. The city falls, and we are then reminded again of the outcome of this harlot just a few verses later that had real faith in God. God makes it clear, makes sure. In, Holy Spirit ensures that we don't miss this truth because just a couple verses later, verse 25, what does he say? Or what does the Bible tell us? And Joshua saved Rahab, the harlot, alive her father's household and all that she had and she dwelleth in Israel even unto this day because she hid the messengers which Joshua sent to spy out Jericho it's interesting <coughs> we don't base our faith on archaeology we studied a lot last week about Jericho we don't base our faith on that but I, I like it when that kind of stuff supports what we already read in the Bible because it will always come back around <laughs> but what's interesting in some subsequent archaeological digs, as they've unearthed more of Jericho and several different groups from several different countries over many years, as they've done so, they began to fall, find evidence of a small portion of the wall that, as they dug it out, was amazingly still standing. And as they kind of dug it out more, they realized this wall had a house attached to it. It's amazing. Because we saw last time, even some of the excavations, how the walls were just totally decimated and wiped out. And these were a couple Germans, uh, archaeologists, that found this. And honestly, in their own report, couldn't believe their own eyes. How could a portion, when the entirety of the rest, and this is part of the northern part of the wall, the entirety of the rest of the walls were down flat. And this part was the only one remaining. How about you? But I think I know the story behind it. Amen. Could be. Could be. You see, my friend, whether we find archaeological evidence or not, we know this to be true because the Bible says so. This is the reality of Rahab. You know what we're reminded in her story? We're reminded that faith, faith in God is always honored and rewarded. Faith in God is always honored and rewarded. One last point, it's kind of the, the, the um, I don't know, P.S. on the letter. It's kind of the, the added little asterisk. What is it? Well, the reality of Rahab, letter E, she was a blessed member of the lineage and family of Christ. It's one of the most amazing realities of Rahab, is that in her faith in God, it made possible for her to be found in another New Testament occurrence of her name. It's Matthew chapter 1 and verse 5. What do we have in Matthew chapter 1? It is the glorious account of the lineage of Jesus Christ following all the way from Abraham, because it calls him the son of Abraham and the son of David. He is, traces his lineage all the way from Abraham to David to Christ. And right there in verse number 5, we find the mention of Rahab. 
Simon begat Boaz, and Boaz begat Rahab, or Boaz, excuse me, of Rahab. And Boaz begat Obed and Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse, and the next verse, Jesse begat David. She was adopted. She was adopted as a Gentile in the family line of Jesus Christ. She is undeniably part of Christ's family. My friend, what does that make you think of today? How about Romans chapter 8, verses 14 and 15? For as many as are led over the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye, ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. As many of them that have trusted in, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. You see, Rahab realized the reality that faith, faith in God, is the means by which we walk through the door, Jesus Christ being that door to enter into the family of God. She's a great Old Testament picture. You take the greatest sinner, and my friend, there is a greater Savior who died on the cross, shed his blood, so that any and all be part of the family of God. And that's faith. Faith accomplishes that. We praise God tonight that faith is the means of salvation. And can I tell you, it's for every great sinner. You, me, David, and a harlot named Rahab. And we give this all to the praise of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank him for his grace. Brother Cliff, you bring